once again to the Constitution and American life with the four B's. It is clearly fall in uh, in America, all except San Diego, which doesn't have, except for one season, uh, any you know any sense of uh, of fall there. Temperatures are dropping, but I have to tell you that today uh, in my uh, hometown of uh, Bakersfield, uh, we are experiencing Oklahoma in 1934 or something like that. It's the Dust Bowl here, which is uh, actually pretty uh, scary. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and most importantly, the, the uh, Major League Baseball playoffs are uh, in high action here, and the game of the century will be occurring uh, uh, later on this evening. And so we're looking forward uh, to that. Just so you know, I am David Richmond. I, I was uh, a teacher of We the People for 16 years. I also was a mentor teacher in their professional development program and the state coordinator for California. Been involved in this program since 1986. Uh, so I have some familiarity with the We the People Assistant the Constitution program, as well as the Constitution uh, in general. Uh, we also have uh, with us uh, Professor, or actually Dr. Uh, Michael J. Williams. From the University of San Diego. He's in the uh, uh, Department of Political Science, uh, deals with political science and uh, international relations, and also is the director of the Changemakers Hub. Don't know exactly what that is, but maybe one day he'll explain that to us. We also have with us uh, Professor Chris Cavanaugh, uh, one of uh, uh, the nation's best uh, high school teachers. He also teaches part-time at the uh, college uh, level. Uh, he's nationally recognized. Uh, and uh, he's now in North Dakota, but for, I think, over three decades taught in Indiana. And lastly, we have uh, Professor Tim Moore, who works at uh, the University of Wisconsin at the Center of the Study of the Constitution, uh, in which uh, uh, to teachers and students and just anyone in general, if you want resources on ratification uh, and uh, the discussions on the Constitution, that's the place uh, to go. Um, Last week, I, I want you to let you, I want to let you know we are a sophisticated bunch. Last week, we introduced terms uh, to this uh, to our audience as sticky and slippery. All right, uh, so we're hoping to add to those sophisticated uh, vocabulary of sticky and slippery uh, today, and give you some other more sophisticated academic uh, terms. So tonight, since we are theoretically, and I'm going to say theoretically in uh, quotation marks, a constitutional republic. We're gonna once again look at the notion of representation. The central question today is to deal with a critique by the anti-federalists of the design slash system of representation proposed in the constitution of 1787. Brutus summarizes this best when he observes that a representative body cannot possibly represent the feelings, opinions, and characters of a great multitude. In this respect, the new constitution is radically emphasized, radically defective. He may be onto something there. Even though each state has two senators, in every state, those representatives are asked to represent a minimum of 570,000 people, i.e. Wyoming, up to nearly 40 million people in my great state of California. In the House, it is an average of 700,000 people per representative. Is that even possible? Is it even possible for a single person to represent that many people? But even more central, I think, to this question is the question of equity. And although it's not enumerated in this question, I think it is a branch that we want to talk about uh, tonight. Wyoming has one representative that serves that 570,000 people. But here in California, each representative represents 770,000. Is that fair? Is that reasonable? Is that just? And remember, good government is measured by justice in the end. And we have this principle, at least in our society, of one person, one vote. Out goes the window, goes that. Also, this problem of this issue of, repre of representation is also problematical when we come to the Senate, to the Electoral College, and to the amendment process. So hopefully those are things we will address tonight as we look at question or unit two, question three in the We the People program. And what I wanna start off with is I usually do is something broad. And so I want you guys to deal with this because you see this all the time in, in opinion sections 
uh, and in, in discussions about the American system. And that is, are we a democracy or a republic? So if you guys could address that, and what's the difference between the two? Because I think it's pertinent to this question of representation. So Professor Williams, I want to start off with you because I know how much you enjoy doing that. Uh, From your point of view, are we a democracy or a republic? And I know that's probably in, from some perspectives a stupid question, but I'm famous for asking those kind of questions. And what's the difference between the two? Yeah, thanks, Dave. And you know, you gotta ask the political science scientist about a category and a definition just to get Tim riled from the very beginning. Um, but it seems to me it's a, it's it's a good question and it's an important question. And I think that um, I would define the United States as adopting a, re a republic rather than a democracy. And to me, republic um, means meant two things to the founders. And although Tim and Chris can definitely elaborate on this, um, one one a republic is um, a political institution where the there is no king or queen that's head of state. Right, a republic is something where there's not going to be a hereditary ruler, and secondly, it's it's where there's going to be some sort of representative democracy rather than a direct democracy. And I think you know these terms. We talk a lot about this when we get together. The terms democracy and republic had particular meanings in in the 18th century, and those meanings are what kind of you know um, guided the founders in terms of what they were, were created, and so. I think most of the founders were, were afraid of a democracy. They saw democracy as direct democracy. They saw democracy as leading to um, mob rule. And so definitely they wanted some filters between the people and decision making. Um, and I think that that's why I would say that we have a republic. But Tim and Chris, I mean, would you, would you agree with that initial cut at that? I'm going to go next. That way Tim can clean up behind the parade again. Um, I, I I like to think of if I would tell my students, you know, what type of we have, you know, the famous, you know, Franklin line when he's leaving the uh, convention or Republic, madam, if you can keep it. But I, I mean, I think it, I would describe it as a federal democratic republic, right? Because we know that federalism, we federalism rears its head in almost every discussion we have, and it has to. It really has to because it is a fundamental principle of our founding, and to to this very day is still a fundamental principle of federalism the push and pull uh, between state and national governments. Um, and it is a democracy. It is a limited, you know, at the, at the inception, an incredibly limited democracy. But even Madison was writing about that. I mean, uh, just, I was just was reading a, an unpublished letter of Madison um, talking, and this was actually towards the end of his life uh, when the nullification crisis was brewing and Calhoun was doing his thing. Um, that you know talked about the, the 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 majority ruling and the only way you can get the majority is simply by counting votes and he understood this and he wrote this in in, in several different places about the need for counting votes but it's also a filtered democracy a heavily filtered democracy and therein you get the idea of republicanism uh you know we can well i'm sure we're going to jump into fed 10 at some point in this discussion but the idea of uh you know uh bringing in the best minds you know you filter the talent so to speak um so this is uh you know i i think if i'm not going to choose between the other the the republic or dem democracy I, I think it's a federal democratic republic and we deal with that all the time i guess um I, i'll be um i'll be provocative i don't think we ever were a democracy uh and i uh, I don't know that it's possible. I mean, Madison so much in, in so many words said that uh, anytime you have representatives, um, you're in that republic zone. Um, so I, I think, I mean, even, even down to our neighborhood levels, our homeowners associations, there's always representatives. I mean, maybe back in New England, the town showed up to, you know, and there was the town halls. There, uh, yeah, there were town halls, but I think for most part of our history, it's always been some sort of filtering. Um, I think the real debate is not so much whether, at least in my mind, it's not whether we're a, a democracy or a republic, it's how much filtering in this default representation system that we seem to have 
are we willing to tolerate? How much filtering? How much, uh, you know, to David's point, the ratios. So I think uh, we've always been uh, on the side of republic and very little interest in democracy. So I think implied in this question is not only the ratio, the numbers per representative, which we'll get into more, more depth here in a minute, but also is exactly how do these representatives represent? And all three of you can clarify for me on this, but I, I believe it is Edmund Burke who writes an essay as a representative of an I used to know this by heart, but I'm getting old. And, it, and it's brought forth this notion of the types of representation. There is this delegate versus trustee. And so, so Chris, I want to start with you. It seems to me that, you know, if the, and not that the framers thought in these categories per se, but it seems to me that the framers were definitely thinking of a trusteeship form of representation. So, one, could you explain the difference between delegate and trustee theory of representation? And do you agree with me that at least their notion of it in the 18th century was, was le leaned towards the trusteeship? Oh, yeah, I'll start with the second half first. I would definitely agree with you. It's more of a trusteeship for sure. Uh, though I think you're gonna see um, some folks on the ground, especially anti-federalists on the ground say, no, it's, you know, it's, it's not that, you know, it's a delegate theory. Uh, you're going to represent us. We're going to tell you what to do. But I do think that, uh, that our main founders or main frame framers thought of it was the uh, trusteeship. And the idea is, that, I mean, for the students watching, it's, um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Um, I hate to allude to this, but uh, Profiles in Courage, uh, which, you know, uh, um, JFK did not write, uh, but he gets to put his name on it. Um, and it's looking at senators making choices that will cost them their positions because they're making far reaching decisions because of their view, because of the information that they have, right? And they're trying to, they're trying to put uh, regional or I guess, state interests uh, on the back burner and putting national interests to the front. And, um, uh, you know, the idea is that, trust me, um, because of the information that I have, I'm going to make a good decision that's in the best interest of everybody, as opposed to the delegate theory, where everybody with a keyboard can now contact his or her legislator and say, this is what I want you to do. Well, we would hope that, you know, this, I guess, is my, this is part of my opinion coming out here. We would hope that the people in positions of power, because of those positions of power, would have access to information that would allow them to make more informed decisions than the average person sitting at home doing his or her own research. Mike, I, I'm curious on on this. Um, isn't it, 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 it? And again, Chris says, yeah, his view is that that they were leaning towards the delegate theory, except for some anti-federalists. But isn't it an implied assumption that it would have to be that approach to representation if you are representing? And again, I don't care if it's 40,000 or 700,000. All right. How do you do the delegate theory in that type of population? So isn't our system just implied to be a trustee system? And I think Kavanaugh is raising his hand. Which I said, I, I, I agree with the trusteeship. That's what I thought the framers thought was trusteeship. So right. I want to go on record. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry if I if I said that wrong, but go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I mean, look, you can you can call the system whatever you want, but individual representatives can choose what sort of model they want to adopt. And so, to me, I see this from the perspective of, um, look, politicians they want to get elected. That's that's a common universal truth from 1787 to 2020, and you look out in your constituency, who can put me in office? Who can keep me here? And, you know, I don't know enough about the electoral districts um, in the 1780s, but I do know that someone like, uh, you know, someone from rural Virginia is gonna have different interests they're gonna have to represent than someone from New York City, right? And if it's in their political benefit to be a delegate, to be like, to me, the trusteeship is, 
this idea that these uh, individuals would be thinking about the common good, right? But that has to be balanced with how do I get elected and can I get elected <clears throat> in a way of going against the wishes of 50% plus one who I need their votes to get in office. So to me, it gets in the issues of how districts are drawn, how diverse are districts. Um, and I think it's up to individual represent, representatives to decide whether it behooves them to adopt a delegate or a trusteeship model. So um, the founders might have had something in mind for the system, but to me, this breaks down as soon as you start having elections and as soon as people have to get in the power, they're gonna use whatever, whichever one of these models they think is best. And I think what Burke saw is Burke saw more and more people sort of like not taking into account what was the common good for Great Britain. And that worried him at a time where he saw across the world revolutions happening with people who he didn't think had the best interests of the common in mind. So I think that's the way I would see it. Professor Moore? I have, I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, I, um, Burke, we'll put these resources in the, in the uh, sources section, but Burke's uh, letter to the uh, Bristol electors, I think is the title of it, uh, where you. he is laying out the trusteeship. But there's also another cat in, con in uh, parliament his name is James Berg. Um, my point here, I'll give you the thesis statement. Parliament is also wrestling with what's good representation. Burke represents one group of folks that say, trust us, trusteeship. Berg is another one of these, I think I would, he, today he'd be considered maybe a class, uh, uh, like a radical reformer. Berg was making the argument that we've got, in Parliament, we have crappy representation. And he raises the rotten boroughs. Uh, you know, the, some places are overrepresented, some places are, are, are underrepresented. So I guess my point is uh, maybe a subthesis we inherited a British fight about what goods, and this is 74. Burke and um, Berg are both making these uh, arguments for better, uh, you know, we have good representation, Burke. And Berg is saying we don't. They're both, <laughs> that's both 1774. So Parliament is wrestling with the problem of what good representation is. So how could we as American colonial, British colonials not inherit that, that set of fights about what good representation is? Another point that I was, as I was listening to Chris and uh, Mike is, um, I, I'm, I may be way out on a limb here, but that wouldn't be the first time. Isn't it possible that we claim democracy because it resonates culturally? So it's this cultural ideal, the word is called democracy, but the reality word politically is, represent, uh, is republic. The reality is we got to filter because no one, we can't have a, a, a legislature of three, 330 million people. So this ideal is a cultural ideal. It appeals to our individualism. So we use democracy. We use the word. That seems to be a cultural word. But well, the reality so, of, of republic is this is the re real politic. We have to filter. Well, it does. And so doesn't doesn't you know uh, uh, trustee theory you know fit with and fly? I mean, again, I get back to the question of you know how in the heck is it even possible? I mean, you have to have a filter. If you don't have a filter, doesn't that make members of House like you know, uh, you know, Thurgood Marshall asked the question one time: Is you know, are Supreme Court justices supposed to be potted plants? Is is that what is that what members of Congress are? They're just a potted plant, and you just give it water, and it does what you hopefully want it to do. I mean, you know, so doesn't the very nature of the system, uh, Professor Moore, imply that? And you say yes. filters. All right. Now, I guess the question is, are they only supposed to filter those who voted for them? Or are they supposed to filter all members, all their constituents? Yes. Um, <laughs> well, if you're British, I mean, if you're British, the answer is yes. Um, but I guess, um, I mean, look, you can't, you can't, this is America, dang it. You have to say you're special, you're important. You, you are very, very important, and, and I'm listening to you, and I'm speaking, I, you are important. Well, democracy 
is a very affirmational thing. Uh, and we, uh, for better or worse, we're rooted in, in, in a, a healthy dose of individualism. So I think democracy is very appealing at a very visceral uh, level. Whereas filtering, I mean, our history is like, we don't trust filtered elitists, elitists that filter. So, I mean, our, our legacy is a resentment of that. So I think we're destined to always wrestle with uh, that filtering principle, how, ooh, a little too British, you know, or, or a little too elitist. So I think we kind of, we're set up to wrestle with that dilemma. So Mr. Ka or Professor Kevin, I've got a kind of a two-part question. And if you want to deal with one or both parts, it's, it's up to you. This quote from Brutus is obviously during the ratification in 1787 uh, there. And so I'm curious, what did the Anti-Federalists advocate? What was their position regarding representation? And I am curious about this. Were all Anti-Federalists on the same page regarding representation? So those are two parts, deal with one, deal with both. Help well, I think, I think the first part is, is when you start looking at uh... They, I think the complaint was how small the national legislature was going to be. It's like, how can you have a legislature that, to represent this entire nation that was going to be smaller than, was it, uh, was it Pennsylvania that was going to be larger than uh, the, the new national legislature? So how, their argument was, how can, how can you truly represent people with such a small number? And in terms of the... Um, whether they spoke as one voice, I would say probably, I don't know this, and I'm going to let Tim clean this up, but I would say no, because rarely, I mean, you know, we, talk, we talked about this in the episode before, was that when people say, well, the framers said no, you, they just step away from that argument, because the framers didn't speak with one voice, the founders didn't speak with one voice, and I would say the anti-federals probably not speak with one voice either, but was this a common complaint for the anti-federals? Yes. And the fact that how can this national legislature actually represent the people when it's so small, when all you have to do is look at some of our state legislatures and they actually have a greater membership. I mean, right. lower, I know. House, lower House Rhode Island was larger than the uh, national con uh, uh, house. Well, and again, I know you want Professor Moore to clean it up. So I guess here's my point is, is I started thinking about I just, it. I just want Tim to tell me that I'm right. That's all. That's all I'm saying. All oh, right. I mean, you're you're exactly right. The size of state legislatures were larger than the National Congress. Absolutely. Yeah. But well, isn't I guess. It, go ahead, Mike. Sorry, Dave. Didn't mean to step on you, but I I just want to ask. I guess Tim and Chris, this. I mean, the anti-federals, shocker, are not making a very principled argument because they're okay with filtered representation at the state level. I mean, they're not arguing for direct democracy at the state level. So whether it's this to me is just. They're, they're looking for arguments against what they fear is this centralization of authority, but they can't get away. I think, Tim, you just, your argument about how we always were and have to be a republic, it's the size of the people we're trying to govern for. There's just no other way to do it. You can't do direct democracy with the number of people that were in the United States at the time. So they're stuck Mike, no matter what. Mike, were you accusing the anti-federalists of being disingenuous in their arguments? Just a little. Is that okay? Is that allowed? I love it. <laughs> I, well, well, I, hope I, mean, the, I hope the students pick up on that. I hope students listening pick up on that. I mean, well, uh, I, before we get to any, wait, 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 wait. Before we get to Mr. Moore cleaning this, cleaning this all up, it seems well, to I me it's a clean up. It, well, he, I guess here's here's my challenge: is is you know we talk about federalists and I federalists, and they 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 are made up of of multiple factions. And this issue tends to deal with, you know, the, the issue is proportional representation. Well, there are highly populated states and not so populated states in the anti-federalist faction there. And so I guess that's my question is, is about, was there a consensus view amongst anti-federalists? Because I'm assuming large populated states in the anti-federalist block did want proportional representation in both houses. Am I right? Yep. Yeah, you don't well, hear anti-federalists gripe. You don't hear anti-federalists griping about the Senate in terms of ratios. Their gripe is a is a, uh, an elitist cultural argument, um, but it's not it's not numbers, right? All right. So go ahead. Well, uh, I mean, as with most political, up. as with most political move, movements, there's always the uh, the crazy uncle. Uh, and Pennsylvania, to Mike's point, Pennsylvania is the too much democracy. 
uh, that anti-federalists do not want to, because they, they're unicameral. And remember, Adams in his uh, essays uh, during this time was, was very down on unicameralism because that was, uh, you know, too much democracy. And so Georgia and Pennsylvania are ridiculous. But Pennsylvania has these wild swings with every year's election. And so the anti-federalists have to live with this, uh, oh, you really want to argue? I mean, to Mark's, Mike's point, you really want democracy? Well, let's look at how it works in Pennsylvania <laughs> with these wild swings. So, uh, I mean, Mike's, uh, Mike's right that it's, it's about what is being represented and at what level, whether this, we can take the anti-federalists seriously about their ratio and, and the filtering, their filtering objection. So, oh, Mike, you and I might be a little bit less informed uh, about this framing founding period than the two professors uh, there. I'm curious about your perspective on what is called the Connecticut or Great Compromise. Do you think that it was, do you think it really was a compromise? Or do you think that the Federalists folded, especially when we look at representation? between this proportional and equal and here's here's my i guess take to me the federal is folded and we're dealing with that today we're dealing with the fact that the federal is folded so much giving equal representation uh in the senate that to call it a compromise to me is a stretch i don't know what are you, what are your thoughts about that well i mean and we've we've talked about this in previous episodes we've gotten to this in different ways so the way I'd answer that is, um, I, I, I guess I agree with you, that, but it folded. But I don't know. My, my reasoning for the folding wasn't. This wasn't an argument about representation in terms of what do we want our republic to look like. I mean, this to me is the argument of how do we keep the southern states in this experiment. And to me, the the giving two senators to each state is basically. A way to preserve that slavery is not is gonna is gonna be around. I mean, I when, whenever I think about the formation of the Senate, I always just come back to the institution of slavery, and whether we call that a compromise or we say they folded, to me, I, I know Tim Tim and Chris may disagree. I don't. I think there's something to do with representative theory going on there. I mean, I think there's a legitimate debate, but to me, what's 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 also there is just the question of of slavery and what you need to do in order to keep those states on board. Well, Delaware is the exception to that, Mike. I think generally you're right, but Delaware is the exception because if you remember, they sent their delegates to Philadelphia and in their instructions, they said, do not compromise in any way, shape or form on the equality of representation in the, in the legislature. So there, uh, so there, I mean, there's a Northern state that has no, no dog in the uh, fight on slavery. Uh, but they they too were committed to equality of representation in the legislature. Well, and as the students will know too, the New Jersey plan put forth by Patterson, you know, it's not like New Jersey was a hotbed of enslaving people. So um, it was more that fear of, you know, the larger states running roughshod. But I think, Mike, your point maybe might be better made in terms of uh, the three fifths compromise, in terms of allowing that type of representation, because Right. In the words of it, like Akil Amar, uh, I think he said that helps create what he called the slaveocracy. Yeah. It certainly gave you know, South Carolina way more punch politically than they should have based upon population. Um, so I think that maybe more so the the three fifths compromise as opposed to the the construction of the Senate. And you, you know, I've railed on this on our programs before. You know, there's a great quote for the students watching in, in your textbook, in your We the People textbook about Madison just not being happy with the way the Senate, you know, shook down uh, or came out, you know, so they departed from justice to conciliate the smaller states. And, um, you know, if we talk about that today, I think that that becomes the issue for sure. So, well, so I got it. Yeah, Go I'm sorry, David, because I want to get you from that. Can you explain your thinking in terms of why you framed it as a compromise versus folding, and then why you see it as the federals folded? I, I think it's, to be quite honest, it, it, it works well in eighth grade and 11th grade textbooks. It's uh, partly the implied American exceptionalism. Oh, look at these guys. They all, they compromise. 
what I'm trying to get, I, I guess, yeah, we got a constitution. I, I guess that's what the Federalists got. But we got a constitution destined to fail. And many of them knew it. Whether it was going to be 10, 20, or four score years down the road, it was destined to fail there. And we are living with the consequences of this equal representation today. And not just equal representation in the Senate, as I said in the intro, you know, this notion of representation, this filtering that Professor Moore talks about in the Electoral College, in the amendment process, all right, is now the source of tremendous challenges and problems today. And so I just don't sense that the Federalists fought that hard because in the end, they know they were in the corner. They were backed into a corner and they had no other option because the slave states especially would walk. And, and we see that happening over and over and again uh, throughout our history uh, with those many similar states will walk. And so union was so precious to these people they folded. They didn't fight for pr proportional representation as passionately, which is why Madison left the convention in a state of melancholy and melancholy, not melancholy. I don't know what that is. You know, melancholy and you know, thank that was God it, that was Dolly. in the West, melancholy. Yeah. Thank thank God for uh, you know Tim Moore's poster girl Dolly Ma Madison. You know, uh, perking him up to go write the Federalist Papers. Professor Moore, you look like you're ready to. Tear yeah. Me apart. Uh, okay. So here's some big pushback, David. Um, the, the two issues that I think are embedded in your, um, in your statements are what is being represented? Uh, now, the, uh, here's another 11th grade textbook answer. At Philadelphia, the theory was to represent people and to represent states. Okay, now you obviously don't like that. And that's, and that's, a, fair, that's a fair assessment, how history has played out. All I'm going to push back on is the founders have to accept states. That is a tremendous inertia that we could look at it now. I'm, I'm going to accuse you of presentism, okay? Um, and, and that's fine. I think that's a fair discussion. Are the states still relevant? I mean, Hamilton, we know, didn't think they were at the convention. <laughs> he wanted to get rid of them. But I'm saying uh, everybody thought he was nuts, too, because the reality is the historical inertia of states has to be taken into account in whatever system. I mean, it, it almost shuts the convention down. Uh, so I don't know that it's just a, a, as simple as an 11th grade uh, diagram in a textbook. The reality is a heavy historical inertia that they have to deal with states. Professor Kavanaugh, any thoughts on this? No, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with Tim. It's like, you know, you got to think from where, so where are they when they meet in Philadelphia? Where is the country under the articles? It is state sovereignty. It is a confederation. So how do you move from that that is ingrained in the American mind at the time, that is loyalty to state, my state is my nation, to move to the creation of a strong national government where the states really don't have that role, and you you can't you you can't do that. And um, you know, and did the Federalists cave back to your original point? I, I you know I don't know. It's easy to sit here in 2021 and throw stones, but you know the the idea is that you're going to have to compromise at some point. Am I happy with the compromise they came up with? No, goodness no. I think it's I think it's flawed, but I think Tim's point is well made that we're getting from this this I mean I always call it the sliding scale of sovereignty named uh, after one of my former students. You know here's the power the power rests with the states. Now we're going to try and create this new document. You're not going to be able to go that far, right? You're not going to be able to go to as as far as Madison wanted. So he does get reined in. Well. I'd love to spend uh, the bulk of our time in the 18th century, but the question does imply that we kind of deal with with this issue in a more contemporary sense. And I, I want to look at partly equity of representation, because I think that's the more modern issue, although I do believe that you know proportional and the numbers 
is very problematical today. And, and we've kind of talked about that. What's always fascinated me, and I'll be honest, this, I didn't become enlightened to this issue until very recently. The Permanent Apportionment Act of 1929 fixes the House of Representatives at 435 members. All right, and I used to teach that, you know, just one of those factoids, and this is why we have 435. And it and it didn't come to me until actually I read a source that that diminishes over time, all right, the representation of large states, because every state has to be guaranteed at least one representative. In your opinion, Professor Kavanaugh, was that a necessary and proper decision by Congress to make in 1929? Well, maybe in 1929 it was. I don't know the context of the decision, right? They're, they're worried about the Congress getting too big and too many people coming in and sharing, you know, cutting the pieces of the pie even smaller. But, you know. Um, yes and yes. So it, I think it's the ability of Congress to maybe think, OK, well, here we are in 2021. How has this changed? And, you know, as you said, David, and, and I think mathematically, I, I, even though I was told there'd be no math on this quiz, uh, mathematically, you can take a look at this and you see how uh, representation for larger states has been diminished and how smaller states population wise has grown. And believe me, I come from a small state. We are a, we are a huge state, but we have one congressman because of our population. I try to have this conversation with folks here to understand how, you know, they don't want to lose that voice, but it's like, well, how is that fair? So you're okay with the unfairness as long as it tilts in your favor, and most people are. Well, Professor Williams, I actually, I did do some reading, and I, I this question came up because it was a, a book that you gave me, uh, or, or I don't know if you gave it to me, or I, I can't remember the history of it, but uh, it was a very large book on voting rights, or the history of voting. And then I also, I crossed reference it with a kind of a history of immigration. And I came to find out, at least from what I understand, and I could be wrong, that this, this act in 1929 was, was in many ways driven by anti or, or nativist anti-immigration because where the new people were going was not necessarily Wisconsin or North Dakota or Iowa you know, or Missouri, they were going to New York, New Jersey, and places like that. And there was a nativist fear of representation becoming too reflective of this growing diversity uh, 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 there. Is, is that your, I mean, let me ask you this. Does, this, does that act need to be re changed? And, and do we need to grow Congress again? Yeah, you know, so I, I'm sorry if I got kind of convoluted there, but you okay. know, but I mean, what's your sense about that act, uh, and and or or more importantly, do you think we need to drop it and grow the House of Representatives again? Okay, well, to your first point, I do think nativism does have something to do with it, and that the 1920s is also the time period where the very like there were many states that would allow resident aliens the right to vote. Um, and Arkansas was actually the last state, I think it was 1926 or something, who said that resident aliens, these are, these are legal permanent members um, who maybe are not citizens. So I think it's in the wave of, of that. So I, I do think nativism does have something to do with it. Okay, does it need to be increased? I, this is where, <laughs> to, uh, okay, what is, the, the parliament in Britain is what, 660, if I recall? I, what is the number? I mean, it is difficult to govern for this many people, no matter what the size of the body is. So, will the if you just think about the effectiveness of governance rather than the the appearance of what is more represent? I don't know. Is it going to make governance any better to increase the house to six hundred and fifty? Or is it going to make governance worse? That's where I would think through it. Because I think if you really wanted to, if you're worried about representation, then you're going to have to increase the size to a number that it's just going to be unwieldy. Because you really do want, you would want a number, right? Like we have in our local, local communities, right? Like my city council person represents 3,000 of us or 5,000 of us or something, right? I mean, that's about the model that, that Plato and Aristotle thought was ideal 
for representation. But if you if you kind of like try to scale that up <laughs> to the United States, can you imagine how many people? So I don't know what you gain by increasing it by 200 other than feeling a little bit. What's that? Fair, fairness. But it's not going to be, it's still going to be, it's going to be a little less unfair, but it's still going to be unfair. Well, Unless okay, let's, let, let's, 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 let's not, you know, let the good be no, the other. I guess, yeah. I don't, I don't know what the number, like, I guess I'm not sure, like, to, to Chris's point, I didn't know there was going to be math in this quiz. And I'm not sure what the number is that would make it fair. And then, but, but the point is, okay, we, we can agree on the unfairness of the math quiz here. Yeah. But the point is to cap it. All right. With a, what, I mean, look at what the population has done since 1929. Yeah. All right. And I don't know about you, Mike. I have virtually no way to have access to my member of Congress, which is supposed to be the branch closest to the people. We've turned Congress in. The Senate, I understand that it was going to be in large states, really reflective of special interests or you know, larger factions, as one might say in the 18th century. But the House was supposed to be I, a reflection of the voice of the people. And now the House in states like California are removed for the most part from the people. And that's my problem. Anybody? Well, I think that Mike's point is, is you know, does, does a, a greater number ensure greater legislation? Or no, maybe that's more? not the point. Well, your point is that, that your greater number is, may ensure a more reflective legislation, right? Yeah. But I would say in terms of where we are right now, I mean, we're dealing with a body um, that, you know, is has a, I mean, for the students watching and for the teachers watching, I'm trying not to like throw stones at Congress, but it's kind of easy to do because they are, um, not addressing the needs of the people. But that's not because of the size, Chris. It I, has nothing to do with the size of it. Well, that, my point is by increasing the size, does that change that? No, because we look at the- I think that was Mike's point, right? Yeah. Mike was on your point? Yeah. Yeah, but the, are you gonna say, Mike and, and Chris, that the English parliament is more or less I, efficient than the American Congress? I, I don't, I, what I see is that it, it's, to Tim's point a second ago, we are stuck with this state system. So what do we do every 10 years? Like California is losing a seat in Congress, right? Because other states got more. And if, and if all of a sudden, if all of us start moving to South Dakota, we would all get a, more, a better representation. I think under the theory, the framework of the government that was set up, that makes sense that, that you, you, you cap it at 435, and then you move the existing members around to the regions of the country where there's more people. Isn't that you, you more than anybody on this panel, all right, are the poster child of equity. Does it not bother you that this cap hurts states like New York, all right, Illinois, California, which are the most diverse states? Texas. And they benefit, they benefit Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Alaska. To me, the equity argument is really about the Senate. And I know we're trying to stay focused on the House. I mean, to me, if, if we're going to talk about equity where California gets burned, it's it's with the Senate more than with the House. Yeah, but since the act of 1929, that also applies to the House. You, you saw my numbers. The average, you know, the average nationwide is 700,000 uh, people per representative. California's is 770. So again, if we look at the average, we know that there are many states in the 600,000s. And so, and, and, and so therefore my voice in California is weaker in so many ways in the House of Representatives, all right, than millions of people in other states. And that's a problem of equity. equity. We should have paid attention to Nathaniel Gorham. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, this is all. This is all I got, man. <laughs> but no, this is somewhat related. At the convention, I think it was Gorham's. Uh, I'll check myself on this, but I'm pretty sure it was Gorham. He proposed at the convention that all the big states be carved up, and all of the states around the the uh, around the United States should be of equal size. 
he actually proposed that. Now that that went over like a lead balloon. But just think about. I mean, you'd be happy, David. I mean, and but and we all know that when the uh, Western states come in, there's this big question of is there going to be ten states in the Northwest Territory or are there going to be five? So there's there's they're still wrestling with this size issue uh, at the founding. But I, it would be interesting to speculate. I mean, just an interesting mind game. Uh, whether Gorham was onto something there in terms of carving up the big states and and, uh, and it would make the proportional more equitable if all the states had the same size. Well, Dave, can I ask you a question? Oh, of course. Would you not be as apoplectic if you had? <laughs> thing, I was pulling, trying to pull out an old word here. That's would better you, than slippery. Yeah, well, I was going to go. I was trying to work squishy in earlier. Told, I told you we were getting we were getting more sophisticated. Squish, Apo, I know, squishy, squishy, apoplectic. Is okay, Tim's technical terms. Um, but if we were to have, um, like Arizona and having Arizona redistricting council, if we were to have people at the state level drawing the lines for districts and representation within the state in a non-biased, non-partisan way that might be more representative of the state population, would that, uh, would that, would that assuage some of your concerns about the number being ca capped at 435? Well, I guess, depending on what you mean by concerns, how big the circle is, yes, some of them, but it, it still doesn't deal with the issue of equity. Sure, I understand. I, I, okay, and again, California's achieved that. All right, you know, based upon the Brennan Center, we have one of the fairest systems of of, of determining that proportions, i.e., gerrymandering, in the nation. And, and again, I hate to give kudos to uh, former Governor Schwarzenegger, but that was one of the best things that he he you know uh, led us uh, to adopt a a bipartisan or a nonpartisan commission. And so, you know, yes, I would like every state to do that. That still doesn't address my problem. Chris, that you have a greater voice than I have in the House of Representatives. And I don't, you know, and again, I don't, and now I understand the history of 1929. And I understand, and check me if I'm wrong here, Tim, that was the exact concern of the Anti-Federalists, wasn't it? Uh, About the power of the voices of the people in the representative body. Well, their argument was it wasn't democratic or there wasn't enough. Right. Right. But I mean, was there no question? I mean, I just wonder, was was this notion, our 21st century notion of equity, was that even on the radar in the 18th century? Um, well, yeah, as, as well, sure. <laughs> equity principle shows up in the Senate. <laughs> the equity right. principle shows up in one to 30,000. I mean, uh, <laughs> So sure, there, there's there's certain uh, commitments to equity, right? Yeah, so that's my point, and, and Chris, that's where I'm coming from. Is right. your remedy solves a problem, and that is, and then again, that is gerrymandering as it's evolved and developed has compounded this problem geometrically. Oh. All right, you know, but yes. it, you know, even if we have by our nonpartisan you know, fair gerrymandering that tries to create as many balanced districts as possible so that every individual's voice carries some certain weight, that would be great, you know, within a state. But then you get, you know, you know interstate problems. And my problem is Alaskans, Wyomians, North Dakota, these people have a greater voice. And nothing said it to me, you know, we're, we're you know, we're doing this partially in partnership with the Center for Civic Ed and the We the People program. And back in the old days, uh, we used to have this conference in June in which we'd be asked as representatives of, of the center to go meet with our representatives. You know, and I remember I had this, uh, you know, I have a number of friends, you know, one was Todd Houston in Alaska. He would be able to walk into his senator's office and they would know him, all right? They would say, hey, Todd, nice to see you. All right, where I try to get into my senator's office, you know, it wasn't gonna happen. And meeting with that senator as you know one of 34 million people was impossible. And, and that's my struggle here is they designed a system which protects to me the powered interest, the large factions, and the inequality of representation. And, and again, I go back to one of my original points, the Federalist folded you know, on this, you know, uh, because 
proportional representation is one issue. How you determine within the state that proportion is a separate issue. So yeah, I agree with you. I want nonpartisan commissions to decide sure. gerrymandering. And I, 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 I think folded is a strong word when you're going back to the anti the Federalist, uh, you know, at the convention, because I think, Tim, you got to go back to Tim's point, And this is what we're trying to make. You're going from where states were the sovereign bodies and how are you going to get people to move forward? And you're, you've got to do it incrementally. And, you know, that's maybe the as, as much as Madison was upset with the way the Senate turned out, uh, you know, it is a compromise. Did they fold? I, I don't know, maybe, but I think there's a there's a great quote from Franklin at the convention that actually, I don't think, I think someone read it for him. He wrote it down. It says, we're sent here not to contend, right, with each other, but to listen. And if we don't do this, if we show up with our minds already fixed, then we will achieve nothing. And, and Tim made the point earlier that the, uh, you know, this debate over representation it almost sank the convention from the jump. So, you know, I, yeah, I, in the comparative politics literature, there's uh, we we theorize around um, we call them strong men, right? For lack of a better term, like regionalized local power centers that are constantly grappling with the center for control, right? And much of the way I understand African politics and South African politics, it's this tension between these regional leaders and these national leaders, and I think that. What the students should be getting get out of this is that at the founding and even till today, these state leaders are regional leaders. And what history teaches us, the, the way you address this, if you want the center to be powerful, you have one of two options. You co-opt the heck out of them, right? So what it, you co-opt, like you bring them in. So in, in Russia, what Putin did there's still, there's still states there, but he took away the power of the people to elect the governors and he just appointed them. So now all of those governors are accountable to him. You co-opt or you by force take them out, right? And I think we have a brief period in American history after the Civil War where we, what, we see what it looks like to have the national power like in control of the states, telling them who can run for office, who can vote, the terms of which they can re-enter the union, right? And we know that that reconstruction period didn't last long. And as soon as we give up that effort, we go right back to the framework of the states and they have sovereignty to do what they want. But while I, I'm, as, I'm as frustrated with the federal system, I think, as you are, Dave, I just don't know if at the time at the founding, whether there was the coercive power to force those in the states to adopt any other model that's not going to involve states, unless you're going to do it by force. And I just, I, the union at the time didn't, the Federalists didn't have the military force to do that. Well, you know, in, in, a, in some sessions in the future, we're going to be able to, to deal with what happens. I guess here's, and, and again, as is so often, I could be wrong, but it seems to me from what I've read, they knew it. The those who we will label Federalists specifically, and I don't know how deep Washington got into this, but Hamilton and Madison and Adams from afar, they knew that these were Faustian bargains. You know, and yeah, maybe there's faith in the future, but they knew it at the time that they were, you know, maybe uh, uh, providing too good of a deal. So I'm well, not but, doing but also David. Also, you have to factor in that many of the founders thought that slavery in uh, would would not perpetuate itself, and so the main feature of state sovereignty, the protection of slavery, wasn't something that they bargained that would be perpetual. I mean, they really did think that it would die out, and one major piece of the state sovereignty argument would have disappeared. So that. I mean, we, we don't know that Whitney comes along and, and, uh, and upends the whole perpetuation of slavery in the West. So I think you have to, uh, I guess I'm trying to temper your enthusiasm to beat up on the Federalists a little bit. They, don't, they, didn't, have, they, didn't, have a, they didn't have a crystal ball, man. They didn't have a crystal ball. I understand well, that. I, I, oh, Tim, I, I, I got I to gotta jump in. Sorry. I mean, 
uh, students okay. were, uh, he was, he was throwing out Eli Whitney and the invention of the cotton gin, which actually um, perpetuated uh, the, or extended the life of uh, slavery in this country, unfortunately. But um, Madison did. When Madison says the struggle will not be between the large states right. and the small states, it'll be between the states with slaves and the states without slaves. So I read that in his own pen, right, at the convention. And it's just mm -hmm. like, oh, you see it, you see it coming, and yet you're right. you're enabling it to happen. But we all know that, you know, at least the four of us here, that Madison was he like wins like just over 40% of his arguments at the convention, or I guess like he comes away with very little of what he really wanted because he's yeah <laughs> so uh, dave's called the madison a loser um i'm not sure if i go that far but um <laughs> he lost he lost more than he gained that's for sure but i think they did have a little bit of a crystal ball well I, if, if if students watching this are uh on the dave train all they have to do is look <laughs> at hamilton's Hamilton's 16 June speech and his proposal of, of getting rid of the states or making making them administrative units, I think, technically is is how he phrased it. So uh, that, that might be something uh, if Dave's argument resonates with you, that Hamilton's your man in the convention. Where do we get yeah. a ticket for the Dave train, by the way? Yeah, you'd have to, you'd have I, to go I to London. I don't know you, that I ever agreed to get on the train, actually. but <laughs> you'd, you'd have to go to the Sierra Tucson uh, Rehabilitation Center to get those tickets uh, there. Uh, for uh, mental disorders, it's I, like I the Hotel imagine. California, Tim. Uh, like yeah, California. that that too. But uh, yeah. I also want to say kudos, uh, Tim. You helped me uh, temper a little bit on that uh, about the whole slavery issue and and their feelings at the time that that would die out, which would then change the whole notion of sovereignty. Uh, as we come to a close, I want to give each of you a chance. Uh, uh, to, to make a closing comment on this. And I am wondering if anybody wants to, with this issue of representation in Congress, do you have any suggested reforms? Any things that you would suggest that we, we try uh, against all odds to change as far as uh, representation? So either closing comments or uh, recommended reforms uh, there, Mr. Moore? I, uh, I have one serious one and one not so serious. I, I do think we ought, to, um, we ought to increase the House uh, I don't, but to Mike's original point, I don't know that we get substantively better representation, but we're a nation of experimenting, I think. So why not try it? Uh, I also think uh, getting rid of air conditioning uh, in Washington, D.C. might get us better, uh, more efficient. Uh, taking, taking all air conditioning out of federal <laughs> buildings, uh, I think meetings would be short and they may, they may be more efficient. Brilliant. That is the most brilliant well, no. thing I've we, we all have a friend, David Adler. David Adler proposes that uh, that they not, uh, there be a housing subsidy and they kind of be forced to stay in D.C. to get better representation because they hang out with each other more. Um, so, uh, I mean, maybe if David's with us later, we could ask him about that. But, um, yeah, well, that's, all, that's all I've got because because I'll let I'll let the other two that are more well, attuned to what's going on now answer on this. For the, for the students watching, um, the whole the old adage used to be is like you wanted to be out of D.C. by the Fourth of July, pre air conditioning, right? Pre air conditioning. I think that was like most of uh, three of us. I think that was like our eighth grade year. I think, Mike, I'm not sure you were even uh, a gleam in your father's eye at that point. But for us, I think maybe our eighth grade year, the idea of uh, air conditioning in D.C. so that would force that efficiency be out of town by the you want because you want to be out of dc by the fourth of july it's hotter than blazes um david if you're asking me yeah I, i'd say uh you know i'm i'm ready to blow up the senate you guys have heard me rant on this enough i think the senate is uh you know the idea of the minority control I mean, that's what we have i i just struggle with that uh, i do i would like to see the house increase in size but i don't think you know, I'm kind of back to what Mike was saying earlier. More doesn't mean better. I mean, right now, we've got a Congress that can't find its rear end with both hands. And people are more um, responsive to their money donors than they are their constituents. So I think you can't talk about reforming or changing Congress until you actually talk about one, which we addressed earlier, is dealing with the gerrymandering issue. And two, getting the big money out of politics because we see this right now 
representatives, senators, or in the House are more rep there. Some of them, I should say, um, uh, have to see who's writing their checks more so than their constituency. So, Professor Williams. Yeah, I, didn't last year didn't didn't I have like a ten point plan of how to reform things? It was awesome. <laughs> you and Joseph Stalin. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I I agree with I agree with what Chris just said. I'll just build on it. I think that um, I, and I agree with Tim. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the blowing up. I'm going to stay within like we keep the system, we reform it. So this is what I would say, is that we definitely need to look at gerrymandering. I think um, the Cook political report says that there's only like 20 to 40 of the 435 seats that are actually competitive. I mean, they're, they're all pretty much going to go to one party or the other. So I think that some sort of redistricting where they're competitive. Um, I think the money is a big issue and Chris has brought that up. And I also think of, about the, the one person or first past the post system. I think I think we'd be better served with a system to use a more contemporary um, idea of proportional representation. Students, this is not what the founders was talking about. They were talking about population, but proportional representation, as I'm talking about, is having an electoral system where you can have minority parties actually get power. Because um, I think to where we started, I think there are good reasons why we have a filtered system. And I think what we should be thinking about is how do we make the filtered system more representative and more accountable to the, the, the voices out there? And I think that having more parties in the room in Congress debating issues, it may not speed things up, but things are not going to get much slower anyways. And at least at least we'll have we'll have you know better debates and represent all the different views of, of people out there. Well, I concur with my uh, colleagues, and all I'd say is we need to uh, uh, eliminate the uh, Permanent Apportionment Act of 1929 or make a new law. And let, okay, we'll cap it again, but let's cap it at 600. All right, it'll create jobs because they'll have to expand the size of the Capitol building. So there's a jobs program uh, there, plus the number of representatives, staff member, no, members. No, no, so. no, no, no. Make them share desks. Make them share desks. <laughs> That, I mean, with well, no AC. I, yeah. Uh, uh, oh gosh. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. We're not going to go down that path. Well, as I said, uh, we would uh, we would expand your vocabulary. So tonight we had the word squishy uh, and apoplectic uh, uh, there, Mr. Moore. You wanted to say? Yeah. I, I can't. Um, if this is this the concluding comment for uh, part? Yes. Sure. All right. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. You, you I just taken over the. I just taken over the day train. You didn't. You didn't hear the theme music that cues up when it's concluding <laughs> remarks. No, on, I man, was, uh, you were at the production I, meeting. I'm going to suggest there's a. Re <laughs> there's a great resource. I I think I'm a little frustrated that we've not. I mean, a lot of our discussion has been about the constitutional political nature of representation. Some of the anti-federalist arguments were more cultural. Um, and there's a great speech by Melanchthon Smith at the New York Ratifying Convention, where he lays out the cultural characteristics of a good representative. Um, so I, don't, I, I hope students would uh, maybe pay attention to some of the more uh, less constitutional, less political parts of this, al although they're very, very important. But there originally was a part of their argument that had to do with the kind of person uh, that would best represent. Uh, so we'll put the Melanchthon uh, speech in the resources. But pay, I, I think that might be worth students' consideration as well. So your SAT uh, word for the week, uh, students and teachers, is apoplectic. And did I say that right? Apoplectic? Apo apoplectic. Apto, apto, oh, I can't see. I can't Apa, even say it. Apoplectic. 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 Okay. Uh, and by the way, I'm not, as you watch this, I'm not apoplectic. Okay. Uh, it's called I Am Excited. And these three gentlemen make me think like no other three people in the universe do. And when I'm forced to think, I get excited. So it's being excited and stimulated, not apoplectic apoplectic 
uh, there. Well, uh, he so, bet this Susie to the junior prom. Excitable right, so, boy, they all they said. All okay, okay. So uh, next uh, session, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna we're excited. We're gonna have a a, a, a longtime guest of ours, uh, Professor uh, Henry Hank Chambers uh, from the University of Richmond, Richmond Law School. We're gonna be talking about the Civil War and equality, and uh, we are excited about that. Until we see you again, peace, love, yogurt, tacos, and let's pray for rain. Bye-bye, bye-bye.